Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just wrapped up the round of 32, and I think all things considered a pretty efficient way, but now we are going to be getting into some NBA as we have the Rockets surging themselves into playoff contention. It seemed like they were dead in the water after an encouraging start to begin the season. I was on the record saying that they were one of my more fun teams to watch on League Pass as they're young, they're hungry. Ime Udoka, even though the Celtics fan in me has a little bit of resentment for how things played out there, I believe he's an incredible coach and he gets his guys to play really hard and we've seen them playing with an edge over the course of the past month or so, really all season as a whole. But The issue with them, especially early in the year, was the inability to win on the road. They definitely showed some of their youth with that. And, you know, they brought in a couple, a little, you can say more veteran guys in Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks this past offseason. But I definitely wouldn't consider Dylan Brooks to be, you know, a fully mature veteran up to this point, as well as I do think he has been playing specifically as a defender. But they ended up falling to 25 and 34 entering March. Since then, they have gone 10 and 1 to get back to 500. And they now sit just one game behind the Warriors, who during that same stretch, at the end of March to now, have gone 7-12. and 12. So again, one game back for the Rockets from the 10 spot, the final play-in spot. And we are just under three weeks away from the last regular season games of the season. And so I wanted to sort of dive into Houston a little bit here, who has been a very interesting case since the beginning of March where, like I mentioned, they are on a nice winning streak. Currently, I believe it is eight straight games. And what's a little bit even more so impressive is the fact that they have done so without the help of star center Alperin Shengun, who Shengun has really emerged as one of the top guys, top young pieces in the league as a whole, really, but has been an incredible player and probably the number one asset asset for the Rockets despite having multiple top three picks the past couple years as well but he has been the main catalyst for them and yet they are on this win streak they've won six straight games without him he went down late versus the Sacramento Kings where it was ruled a grade three ankle sprain and which is nothing too major but it was initially reported that he would be out for the rest of the season. Now the Rockets are still in contention here, so maybe he could make a return, but what version are we getting of him in terms of overall health? That is still definitely a big-time question to consider. But either way, what we have seen definitively since Shengun has left is Jalen Green elevating his play to another level. He's averaging 31.7 rebounds and 3.5 assists on 53-48 shooting splits in the six games without Shengun here. Only one team out of the recent set of games is in the top half of the league in defensive rating. The Cavs, who are missing Evan Mobley in that matchup as well. So do with that what you may. But Houston is playing some really good basketball right now, led by Jalen Green, who was, of course, the number two overall pick just a few years ago. The Rockets are second in the league in offensive rating and second in the league in net rating in the past six games since Shengun has gone down. So they haven't dipped. It's not just an anti Shengun thing here, because in the past 11 games, they're also still second in offensive rating and third in net rating. And it is a lot due to the way that Jalen Green has been able to conduct the offense, who I can't say I've been the number one fan of through his career, but I always defended him because of the fact that people were trying to 
throw him out as a bust just a couple years into his career, which I personally thought was ridiculous because we've seen the flashes of him. Yes, the inconsistency sometimes can be very concerning, and I understand that, but and the efficiency as well in terms of and this is something that I sort of talked about with Nelson, the host of the GSMC Basketball Podcast, also on our network here. Feel free to check him out. I joined him on Friday to talk a couple things, including the G League Ignite shutting down, which Jalen Green is, of course, an alumni of. He was drafted second overall after playing for the Ignite. And really, we talked about the fact that it's not the best place for development with a lot of these young stars. There's not necessarily a team first atmosphere. It's a lot of just trying to make sure that you get yours in order to become the best possible draft prospect. And then Jalen Green came into an entirely rebuilding Houston Rockets organization that was dealing with the departure, the surprise departure really of James Harden, Steven Silas, a young head coach, a rookie head coach, and hadn't really found his way in the league yet either. So it wasn't necessarily the best of situations for Jalen Green. And, you know, we had seen flashes. And just for a number two overall pick just a couple years ago in 2021, I wasn't ready to fully turn the page on him because the talent is clearly there. Now, can he become a winning player? That's still to be seen a little bit, but... People were calling him bust, calling him a bust earlier this year. I could never get behind that. I also feel like maybe sometimes I hold out a little bit too long on certain players, but the talent with Jalen Green was way too glaring to officially turn the page on him. And supposedly the Rockets, there was just a report that came out within the past 24 hours. I'm sorry, I don't have the source right on me, but there was a rumor that Jalen Green, the Rockets offered Jalen Green and multiple picks in exchange for Mikhail Bridges of the Brooklyn Nets, which would have been very interesting to see. I mean, you want to talk about in not the least critical way possible, but some selfish basketball would be Jalen Green and Cam Thomas as a backcourt playing together. I can't imagine how that would have worked out necessarily. Um, Because Cam Thomas is having a nice season as well. I don't want to be very anti-Cam Thomas, but there are times where I really just question whether or not he can fit in a team environment. But either way here, that was ultimately rejected, and I'm sure the Rockets are happy they held on at this point where he just turned 22 years old, and there is still plenty of time for him to emerge. Now, he doesn't necessarily have the playmaking abilities that would take him to you know point guard levels but I do feel like oftentimes we see that it takes a little bit more time with certain guards to develop and sometimes that's just the reality of the situation we're seeing Jalen Green now developing and again I don't want to get carried away by this stretch we got to see it over a longer span before we can really go franchise cornerstone level with him But I think he has the physical tools for it. I think he has the skills for it. Now there's a head coach there in Ime Udoka, who granted, not sure totally how he feels about him. If he was totally sold on Jalen Green, then I'm sure there would have been some level of probably rejecting this reported trade offer of him to the Nets. But ultimately, the Rockets are building something here. They also have Jabari Smith Jr., who is getting some very intriguing experience now, starting at the 5, while Alpern Shingun has missed time. He hasn't been incredible during this stretch, but there is a conceivable world where he could turn himself into a stretch 5. I don't think that that is the primary objective here, but he's six foot eleven, and he definitely has the... Shoot it. He has the size to play it. He's a good defender. He's an, a very nice perimeter defender. So the if you want to talk about switchability, playing one through five, 
Smith would be an incredible option, I feel like, to run there. Ultimately, I'd rather have him playing the four next to Shen Goon, but it also gives them maybe a little bit of lineup variety and versatility as they continue to build this thing forward. So I just find that interesting as well. Now, this is with the Rockets. Last thing I'll say on them is I do still feel the... The road games still really scare me. They are 10 and 24 on the road. Again, this youth, you know, they're made up of a lot of youth. I know I mentioned Van Vliet and Brooks, but neither one of them have necessarily been able to overall help the Rockets solve this issue of being a young, inexperienced team and not necessarily being able to win consistently on the road. Now, if you look at this win streak for them, you do have to give them credit for a handful of these games. Now, it's not like they have played a ton of, you know, difficult competition, but they knocked off the Suns at home, or the they knocked off the Suns while they were on the road to kick off March, and then they also have a couple wins over the Kings, or they have one win against the Kings on the road and a win against the Cavaliers as well. Again, it's not necessarily like the level of competition has been extremely high for them, but they are a very intriguing team to me. Now, quickly to wrap this up on the Warriors end of this, like I said, in the same stretch where the Rockets have gone 10 and 1, the Warriors have been 7 and 12 and they have been staggering. 7 and 12 almost sounds wrong. I'll have to double check myself on that stat specifically, but one way or another, they are just a game ahead of the Rockets and they're dealing with some injuries to Steph Curry where he is on minutes restrictions. Last night, they lost to the Minnesota Timberwolves in a close game that had a lot of people upset with Steve Kerr for some of the minutes management and not playing Curry more down the stretch. It led him to giving a quote about how they've been riding on the back of Steph Curry for too long and that they need other people to step up for them as well. And Curry, of course, suffered an ankle injury about a month or so ago, a few weeks ago against the Chicago Bulls late in that one. But Kerr said that we can't, quote, we can't expect to just ride Steph game after game after game. We put the burden on this franchise on his shoulders for 15 years. We can't expect him to play 35 minutes. He went on to say, if you want to say that him playing 30 minutes instead of 32 is a difference between a win and, lo and a loss, I totally disagree with that. We're trying to win the game and we're trying to keep him fresh too. So it is interesting sort of how they are going to choose to balance this considering the fact that they are now in this close race. Now, they've gotten some players to sort of turn around. They've gotten Chris Paul healthy. Klay Thompson seems more comfortable in his role off of the bench. But either way, not a great position here for the Warriors, who are one of the most expensive payrolls in the league and are just two games over 500 and could see themselves on the outside of the play-in tournament, let alone the playoffs itself. So, has been a pretty discouraging season for the Warriors here. Not that it's impossible for them to at least turn their act around some at the end of the regular season, but their contention hopes are just about non-existent. I know it's hard to fully turn the page on a team that has that same nucleus, but at the same time, I just don't see it with them. I have a hard time believing that they can even go into LA and knock off the Lakers in a winner go home situation. But let me know how you guys feel about that same topic in the comment section. Um, now we are going to be taking another break and when we come back, we will be getting into the NFL owners meetings and starting with the conversation about the New England Patriots and what their future looks like. So stick with us and we will be right back. <laughs> 